four of our five-week uh, workshop on the spiritual, uh, the on the uh, discernment of spirits of Saint Ignatius. Let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for these great gifts that you've given us, the great gifts of the of the works of Saint Ignatius of Loyola. We thank you in a special way for his best work, for the, the work of the discernment of spirits. We ask you, Lord, to help us to have a deeper understanding of the discernment of spirits so that we can discern your voice amidst all the other voices and move towards that voice every time. We ask this in your name, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So just as a little bit of a review, we said that discernment of spirits is all about determining what are the movements within us, whether or not it's a movement of desire, a movement of repulsion, a, a movement of anxiety, a, a movement of love, all of those movements within us, number one. Then we determine the source of the movements. Where the, where is, what is the source of the movement? If we have a desire for something, does the desire come from the false spirit or from the good spirit? And sometimes it's not so obvious. We have to spend a little time discerning it. And then thirdly, we determine what is our response to this movement. So what is the movement? Which spirit is giving us the movement? And what's our response? And we talked about the four states of being. Consolation, desolation, false consolation, and difficult consolation. Desolation and consolation are the two major states of being. And when you're in consolation, the two biggest indicators of that are, number one, that you have a great desire for faith, hope, and love. And number two, that you have a sense of the closeness of God. So those are the two strongest senses of consolation. Desolation, on the other hand, is a sense of that you, you no longer filled up with great, hope, great desires for faith, hope, and love or that you feel that God is uh, distant from you. And we talked about some others too, didn't we? Like fear and disquiet, uh, anxiety, uh, a, a movement towards uh, uh, secrecy rather than transparency. All of those would be indicators of desolation. So today we want to talk about what is my response to the different states of being. So responding to desolation, how would we respond to desolation? These are the six ways that we respond to desolation. So when we are in desolation, we, we wanna, we're gonna have to do some hard work. And uh, notice uh, th there's a lot to talk about here because, uh, because desolation is the hardest part, right? It's the thing that we struggle with the most. When you're in consolation, Ignatius says that the good spirit is whispering in your ear, so you can sort of do what your gut calls you to do when you're uh, in consolation. When you're in desolation, he says the false spirit is whispering in your ear, so you can't really trust your instincts quite as well. That's why you need to do a lot more spiritual work when you're in desolation, the state of desolation. So let's just go through these a little bit. First, we name and normalize it. We name and normalize it. Let me get to my, the place in my notes. A lot of times, if we can get to the point where we can just say it, we can just identify that we are in desolation, and we say, oh, oh I, I know what's happening. I'm in desolation right now. A lot of times, just saying it out loud will give us a great deal of relief. Uh, you, there was a psychologist who once said that trauma, trauma, is experience seeking articulation, which means that we have an experience and we don't have a way of articulating what we just experienced. And that's why it's traumatic for us. A perfect example of that is we have a good friend. This person I call my good friend. And this person who I call good friend just hurt me deeply. Well, that's traumatic for me. Why is it traumatic? Because it doesn't fit the label that I gave that person. I can't articulate what just happened. Once we find a way to articulate what happens, it's no longer traumatic anymore. It, it may still hurt, but it's not traumatic anymore. So for example, in that case, so, okay, I have a good friend who's human, <laughs> a good friend who's human and who's going through a difficult time right now. 
and that's why they hurt me. Okay, I just articulated the experience that I have. I'm still hurting, but it's not traumatic anymore. So when we name things, it tends to take the trauma out of it for us. Huh? I think we see that in Genesis chapter 1, when God uh, tells Adam and Eve to name all of the gifts of creation that God has given us, that there is inside of us this calling from God to name things. And when we do it, a lot of times it, it helps us to get a bit of a grasp on the situation. So that's the first thing. No unnecessary decisions. Ignatius says, in time of desolation, never make a change. Be firm and constant in the proposals and determination in which one was preceding such desolation. Because in consolation, the good spirit guides and counsels us more. So in desolation, the bad spirit, with whose counsels we cannot find the way to a right decision. Ignatius says that if you are in desolation, if you're in desolation, you're not going to be able to make a good decision. Why? Bad data. You're getting bad data. The, the data that you're getting is whispered into your ear by the false spirit. Huh? Perfect example of this, Genesis chapter 3, I think it is, when, when the serpent speaks to Adam and Eve. And the, the serpent is whispering in, in Adam and Eve's ear that, oh, you know, did, did the Lord God say not to, not to eat of that tree? Hmm. Well, I don't think that's really going to happen. He, they're getting bad data, right? Adam and Eve are getting bad data. They're in desolation. And therefore, they, they can't make a, a good decision because they don't have good data. When we are in desolation, the best we can do, if we can, if we're able to, is just hold on and wait until we get to a place of consolation. Uh, now, sometimes deadlines come. We have to make a decision, right? That happens all the time, right? So sometimes we have to make a decision in the midst of desolation. What do I do in that case? Well, that's where I re rely on my support network. I rely on my support network. And what do I mean by support network? It's very simple. It's the elders in my life, the people who are a little further along than I am in, in maturity, especially in spiritual maturity. Usually it's someone who's older, but not necessarily, right? It could be someone who's younger. So the elders in my life, the companions in my life, which is a friend, but, but a special friend, a friend that, that actually leads me to growing closer to God, the, a friend who knows me and actually pulls the best out of me. That's what I mean by a companion as opposed to just a friend. And then the church, the church's teaching and, and the sacraments themselves. That's, those three things are what I call the support network. Okay? When we are in desolation, we have to rely on the support network a lot more. We have to let them uh, lead us a great deal more. And sometimes we might even let them make decisions that we would normally make ourselves. There are times when we're just not in a good state. And so we, we let the people who love us and the people that we trust, we let them make the decisions. Huh? Uh, the metaphor, turn over the car keys, right? When you're in desolation, you're driving under the influence. You're driving under the influence of the false spirit. And, and once you recognize that, once you've named it, then maybe you turn over the keys to someone who's not in desolation. I'll let you you take over. I'll let you, you drive the bus, so to speak. So if I'm in a place of desolation myself, I know that I'm not in a good place, and I have to make a big decision, I go to my great friends. You know, I go to my spiritual director. I go to my religious superior and I say, listen, I'm not really in a good space, and I have to decide this. Can you tell me? And if I'm in consolation, I'll take their advice, but I'm going to make the decision in the end. If I'm in desolation, I I might I at least would weigh their, their advice much more, and I might even turn over the decision to them if the desolation is too strong. So that's what I call relying on your support network. The next one is very important, exposing the lies and twisted truths. Exposing the lies and twisted truths. Uh, the false spirit, we call the false spirit false because the false spirit tells us lies things that just aren't true. Uh, but over the years, I've sort of learned that, and especially once we get more mature in the spiritual life, 
what more often happens is that the false spirit doesn't tell us lies as much as twisted truths. The false spirit will tell us something true, but it's like looking in a funhouse mirror, huh? It's going to be stretched or, 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 or uh, somehow distorted in some way. It's a truth, but it's a distorted truth that makes it look uh, different than it normally does. That's the twisted truth. Huh? So for example, let's say that uh, I'm, I'm having trouble with my friend right now. My friend has been, has been neglecting me and, and maybe saying unkind things again and again. The twisted truth might be this. She doesn't like you anymore. Uh, and maybe she never liked you at all. The truth in it might be she's upset with you right now. And it's coming out again and again. That's the truth, is that she's upset with you. The way it's twisted is she never liked you. It's the twist in it, huh? She never likes you. She doesn't respect you. No, she respects you. She's just upset right now. So, so I think what often happens is the false spirit takes a truth and then twists it in order to tell us a lie, uh, especially when we're in desolation. These two, these last two go together. Be gentle and encouraging to yourself and uh, be firm with the false spirit. So let's talk about each of them, but then we're going to talk about how they go together. So this is what St. Ignatius says about a person in desolation. He's trying to actually be gentle, and in, he uses the word indulgent, actually, that we should be indulgent with a person who's in, in desolation. He says, let the one who is in desolation consider how the Lord has left him in trial by his natural powers so that he may resist the various agitations and temptations of the enemy. Since he can resist with divine help, which always remains in him. These are words of great encouragement from St. Ignatius. He's saying, you can resist, that God has given you divine help. And that, that divine help will always remain in you, so you can resist. He says, since he can resist with divine help, which always remains in him, though he does not clearly feel it, for the Lord has taken away from him the great fervor and the intense grace, but leaving him with sufficient grace. So Ignatius says that when you are in desolation, you don't have the great fervor. And you don't have the sense of grace. It doesn't feel like grace is with you. But he hasn't left you with the things that you need to fortify yourself against the false spirit. He's being gentle and encouraging for a person who's in desolation. And you need to be gentle and encouraging to yourself. You need to make a choice to be gentle with yourself when you're in desolation. However, we, he says we have to be firm with the false spirit. He says this, the evil spirit behaves like a spoiled child. If a person is firm with children, children give up their petulant ways. But if a person shows indulgence or weakness in any way, children are merciless in trying to get what they want, stomping their feet in defiance, wheedling their way into favor. So our tactics must include firmness in dealing with the evil spirits in our lives. So he says that it's just like a spoiled child, just like a spoiled child, that you have to be firm with that child. You have to place boundaries and keep the firm boundaries. So with the false spirit when we were in desolation. I had a novice one time that talked about that moment when the serpent was talking to Adam and Eve. He prayed over that passage, and he came back and he said, you know, Adam and Eve's problem was that they entertained the, the serpent. They allowed the the serpent to give his presentation, if you will. He let the, the serpent entertain their thoughts. What you have to do is be firm with the false spirit, not let the false spirit go uh, any further than, than, than you have to let go. Uh, we talked about this as an example from my bus story. I don't know from my bus story from an earlier, uh, an earlier session. I said that I was on the bus, I was trying to pray, trying to be in retreat on a Greyhound bus, and anger kept coming back, and I kept fighting and fighting the anger, and it wouldn't go away. And I finally said to the anger, I said, well, I guess you're going to be a companion on the bus with me, and I can't stop it, but I won't let you drive the bus. 
I will not let you drive the bus. That's me being firm with the false spirit, me setting boundaries and not letting the false spirit get any further than, than he has to. Huh? There's a wonderful poem by Edna St. Vincent Millay that I, I think is all about being firm with the false spirit. This is what Edna St. Vincent Millay says. It's a poem called Conscientious Objector. She says, I shall die, but that is all I shall do for death. I hear him leading his horse out of the stall. I hear the clatter on the barn door. He is in haste. He is business in Cuba, business in the Balkans, making many calls this morning. But I will not hold the bridle while he clinches the girth. And he may mount by himself. I will not give him a leg up. Though he flicked my shoulders with his whip, I will not tell him which way the fox ran. And with his hoof on my breast, I will not tell him where the black boy hides in the swamp. I shall die, but that is all I shall do for death. I am not on his payroll. I will not tell him the whereabouts of my friends nor of my enemies either. Though he promised me much, I will not map him the route to any man's door. Am I a spy in the land of the living that I shall deliver men to death? Brother, the password and the plans of our city are safe with me. Never through me shall you be overcome. It's a beautiful poem. It's all about being firm with the false spirit. I shall die, but that's all I shall do for death. The false spirit's here in my desolation because sometimes we're just stuck in desolation. We don't know a way out. We're just waiting for God to rescue us. Sometimes we're, we're stuck. So we shall have desolation, but we're not going to let it take us over. We're not going to let it drive the bus. Huh? Why, do, why do I say we put these two together? Because in desolation, we are tempted to flip this. We tend to be firm with ourselves and hard on ourselves in desolation, and we tend to be indulgent with the false spirit, allowing, like the serpent in the story of Adam and Eve, allowing the false spirit to entertain us. We're indulgent with the false spirit. We have to make a choice to do the opposite, to be gentle with ourselves and firm with the false spirit. I want to pause for just a moment and see if you have any questions about any of this. Yes? Um, And I'm not sure it's appropriate not to just say. Sure, no problem. circumstances in our lives, like a very old issue for me from the time I was a child. Yes. You know, I'm cool with it. We were with friends. Yeah. Like every now and then something will happen. It's like, right. oh, there I am again. Right. And so, do, do you understand? The Absolutely. That's a great, let me, let me take a stab at the answer. You tell me if I'm getting at it. It's a good question. I'm going to repeat the question for the people online. You said, what's the relationship between desolation and what we might call normal, uh, like psychologically normal feelings that we sometimes go through, especially maybe wounds from the past. And it's normal to be feeling you still have that wound. It's still there. There's still that, that jab, huh? that little jab inside of it. But you're not letting it take you over, huh? Yeah. I would say the way that you described it, if you're not letting it take you over, and you're feeling those feelings, but you're still in faith, hope, and love, and you're still staying close to God, I would say you're probably in difficult consolation instead of desolation. Everything depends on whether or not you have great desires for faith, hope, and love, and whether or not you are close to God and feeling God's closeness. If you have those two things, even if you're feeling these negative feelings, even if you feel the pain of it, even if the pain's intense, you're still in difficult consolation. Now, if you let the desolation, if you let those thoughts and feelings get to you and you let them affect the way that you're acting out faith, hope, and love. So, for example, there's a deep, deep wound and it's got you depressed and it's got you in a terrible space and you start snapping at people, start hurting people. Now you're in desolation. You're going away from faith, hope, and love. Or you, you, you feel these terrible this wound from the past, and you're letting it keep you from God. Like suddenly you're not 
you're not really staying faithful to your prayer, for example. Now you're in desolation, okay? So I would say these, and you said it well, normal, very normal uh, feelings that we all have from wounds from the past. Uh, it could be desolation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're in desolation. Everything depends on those two things, whether or not you have great desires for faith, hope, and love, whether or not you're close to God. Wonderful, wonderful question. Thank you. Barbara? Sure. My career or my life at the time. Yes. There were people attacking you, you know, throwing you questions that you're in the right place. Right. I think that very often desolation, it's not really our fault that some horrible circumstances led us there, right? Now, to the extent that we can choose to live out of faith, hope, and love and choose God each time, we can move out of desolation and into, into difficult consolation. Huh? Well, I was, I it's... Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, being, being attacked, and, and it's like, Mother Teresa came along, and, and none of her prayed, you, you prayed, you know, so I prayed, and I thought, well, I'm going home, you know, but then I went to the superior and told her, you know, that I was going home, and she said, in two weeks, you'll be in Rome. Oh, wow. So, and then in Rome, I went into consolation. You got into consolation in Rome, huh? Okay. Able to make a free choice. All right. Good. Any other questions about this before we move on? So this is responding to desolation. We don't have to spend nearly as much time on the other states, but we want to spend a lot of time on this one because this is the part that we're in most pain, and we really want to try to do all that we can to help ourselves to get to a better place. So how do we respond to difficult consolation? And remember, difficult consolation is when it feels like desolation, but we're actually, we're actually in God's grace. We're in God's grace, and we, we have great desires for faith, hope, and love. How do we respond to that state of being? We have to treat it much like desolation. So we have to use this affirmation and encouragement that we were talking about before, this is that be kind and gentle to yourself and be firm with the false spirit. So you see, we're doing the same things we did in desolation. Even though we're in consolation, we sort of, in this way, have to treat it like desolation because, uh, because it's a painful state of being where we are. And just like in desolation, we want to avoid decisions if we can while we're in difficult consolation. Why? Because again, we're kind of in a painful place. Let me just give you an example of that. Someone told me that, uh, and some of you might be able to help me with this, but uh, I heard that there's a general wisdom out there that like, if someone who's uh, an elderly person who loses a spouse after being decades together, there's a general secular advice that they shouldn't make any changes, like they shouldn't sell their house, they, shouldn't, they should just hold on for a while, at least for a few months. Why is that? Well, because they're kind of going through a really difficult transition, huh? And they might still be in consolation if they're filled up with faith, hope, and love and close to God. They still be in consolation, but still it's a difficult time because they're going through that grieving process. So maybe they want to wait and avoid making a decision at that time. And then relying on the support network, those, the, the companions, the elders, and the church, huh? Responding to false consolation. No, there's a problem with responding to false consolation. False consolation is self-deception. So we don't know when we're in false consolation. We are in the dark about it. We think we're in consolation. And so we can't really consciously respond to false consolation because we don't even know that we're in it. So uh, what can we do? Well, when we're in consolation, we can at least work on prevention of false consolation. And how do we do that? By forcing ourselves to remain open to the concerns of our, our support network and by always testing the spirits. Huh? In other words, even when we're in places where we feel like we're in consolation, we should test the spirits just to make sure because there are times when uh, we think we're in consolation, but we're actually not. It's not from the good spirit. Uh, the letter of the first letter of John, so 1 John chapter 4, this is what uh, the author of the first letter of John says. Beloved, 
Do not believe every spirit, but test spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone into the world. And so we should be ready to test the spirits, even the ones that make us feel like we're in consolation. Test even those. Huh? That's a way that we can prevent false consolation. The other is to the concerns of our support network, that if we have good people who really love us and are really wise, and we're going in a direction we think is the right way, but they're not really with us, they, they, they're like, I'm not sure you're doing the right thing here. We really pay attention to that. huh? That's, those are ways that we can prevent false consolation. But we might want to talk about, it's a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's an important one. Since we can't respond to our own false consolation, are we able to respond to someone else's false consolation? In other words, can we help another person whom we find in false consolation? And this is my own sort of way of looking at that, is that when a person is in false consolation, let's, pr let's pull up a good case study for this. Let's say, a very simple one, let's say that you are a parent, uh, a mom or a dad, and your child is really fallen for, become infatuated with someone who's extremely immature and not leading your child in the right direction. But they think he hangs the moon, huh? They think, oh, he's the one. But you're, you, you're the mom, you're the dad, you just can tell that, this, that your daughter, your son, is in a false consolation. You might want to ask yourself, should I pop the balloon or tether the balloon? What do I mean by that? The balloon is your, your daughter's in love with this guy who's not really right for him. That's the balloon, the in loveness, right? They're just floating on this, she's floating on this lovely balloon and it feels so good. She's floating on air. Uh, I pop the balloon, that sounds pretty rough, right? But, and it sort of is, but it's where you go and say, I don't think this person is right for you. I don't think you're in a right, I know that you're, you're feeling these great feelings of love, but this person is not the one. I think, and you probably wouldn't use the term unless your daughter would know it, but I think you're in false consolation. That's what pop the balloon is. We more often tether the balloon. Why? Because tether the balloon is a little bit more gentle. And sometimes, if you pop the balloon, if you tell your daughter you, you're dating the wrong person, what's your daughter going to say? I see some... She's going to walk the other direction. She's going to like, Mom, see you later. Uh, so a lot of times when you pop the balloon, one of two things happens. One of two bad things can happen. Number one, they can reject you completely. Just walk away. And oftentimes they do because they're in this state of self-deception. So they just walk away. That's number one. Number two, and this is just as important, if they have a fragile self-esteem, it might devastate them. Uh, and it could like crush them if, you, if you're not gentle with them. Uh, so a lot of times you don't want to pop the balloon. What do you do to tether the balloon? Can you think of, an exa think of a way, like a, for a mom, what would, they, well, what would a mom do in that circumstance? My family would have been, you know, a curfew, and you kiss him when you get home at night, and, you know, restrictions. That's, that's a wonderful example. So one way that, that a mom might tether the balloon, not tell, not tell her that she can't see him, but like put a very strict curfew so you can't stay out after a certain time and you can only see them under these circumstances, you're tethering the balloon there. You're tether, tethering the balloon. You know, for what it's worth, St. Ignatius says, so Ignatius says, what's happening in false constellation? He says that the evil spirit is in the guise of an angel, dressed up like an angel. But he says, Ignatius says that he can't keep it up for very long that the false spirit can play the role of an angel, but eventually his slip will show. <laughs> eventually, <laughs> eventually you'll start, he'll say, he says this, eventually you'll start to see the tail of the serpent. That's what he says. You'll start to see it. So I think what you're talking about is you can restrict the, the daughter, pretty strict, and over a bit of time, she'll be able to see it herself. Uh, good, any other things you would do, mom? Mom of uh, eight or nine children? Nine. nine? Uh, and ask your child to talk about the, the person. And, uh, 
Wonderful. Talk That's about, uh, what she likes about him and so forth, and she may not find enough words to say. <laughs> that's, a, that's an excellent uh, way to tether the balloon. Get the child to talk about, get your daughter, oh, tell me about him. What, what do you like about him? And then maybe even ask a question that you know is going to be difficult for her to answer. Uh, so what are his plans for college? <laughs> what job does he have? You know, those kind of questions. That's a really way, good way of tethering the balloon. You know what I like about that way is that you're actually, if you do it well, you might actually be bonding with the daughter and that's going to help in the long run, as opposed to this maybe will separate. Huh? Now, are there cases where you want to pop the balloon? Well, yes, there might be. One is if it's a crisis, like for example, let, let's get to an extreme case where this kid is bad, you know, this kid is in a bad place and he's going to do something harmful. Guess what? You're gonna pop, you're gonna pop the balloon, right? Uh, or let's let's go to a less dramatic now. Let's just say you and your friend, and your friend is 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 doing has made a choice to do something at work that's not horrific, but you just don't you think she's kind of in love with this idea that's not really gonna work. But it's not a, a horrible, tragic thing, and it's not sin. And you're good friends, and she's a tough person. You might be able to say, hey, you know what? I think you might want to reconsider this. That's kind of popping the balloon in a situation where it's not going to be so dramatic. Huh? So those are ways that we can help another person in false consolation. Otherwise, again, we treat it like desolation because false consolation is desolation. So what does that mean? Be gentle with the person. You said you would talk to the daughter and ask the daughter, ask what, you're being gentle with her, but also be, false with, be firm with the false spirit. And that's the boundaries that you talked about setting. Huh? Sometimes you try to pop the balloon and it doesn't work. That's right. Sometimes you try to pop the balloon and it doesn't work. Pop a few that didn't work. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. How do we respond to consolation? Well, that's the best one, right? When you're consolation, you're in good shape. So in many ways, much of what you want to do when you're in consolation is simply relish the good graces that you have. Relish the graces that you have. Who's the great biblical example of this? The 10th leper. There were not uh, 10 lepers. All of them were healed by Jesus. They were all healed of leprosy. One of the 10, one of the 10 came back and let's put it this way. Let's say it this way. He returned to the place where he encountered Christ and where he experienced healing from Christ. He returned to that place and gave thanks. And because of that, he got a second blessing, the, the blessing of just being with Christ for a little bit longer. Okay? When we are in consolation, we want to return to the place where we experience the healing touch of God. That's how we, let's, let's go through it again and again. We just go back to it. Ignatius called it repetitio. Like we repeat again and again in our prayer the experience that led us to this consolation. Huh? And if I'm helping you when you're in consolation, I might say, tell me the whole story again. Tell me what happened that led you to such great joy. Tell me the whole story again. Because telling the story again will bring back up these wonderful um, deep feelings of consolation. So relish, relish the consolation that you're experiencing. But Ignatius will say, you also want to prepare for desolation. And you can watch uh, session five, and I talk, go into great detail about this. Is Ignatius being morbid here? Is he being kind of a depressing guy by saying, when in consolation, prepare for desolation? No, he's not being morbid. He just knows that you can't do the major work that you need to do internally while you're in desolation. You have to wait till you're back in consolation. And that's when you can do the repair work. So the metaphor that I'm going to use in the next session is this, that I say that my dad and I are in a boat and the, the boat springs a leak. There's a hole in the boat and it's starting to, to pour water into the boat. Uh, I can't permanently fix the boat while we're out in the water. We're going to have to just patch the boat as best we can, patch the hole, and make for sure. Huh? Once we're on firm ground, then we can put it on the trailer and go and do the, the major work that we need to do. So when we're in desolation, all we can do is patch it. All we can do is do the best we can to sort of make sure that we're preventing ourselves from making any wrong decisions. 
And then when we get on firm ground, what is firm ground? Consolation. When we get on firm ground, that's when we can do, okay, let's go back and look at what happened in that desolation and see uh, what we need to change so that the next time it comes, we'll be okay. And then finally, when we're responding to consolation, uh, we, we discern choices. Huh? Ignatius says, when in desolation, never make a choice. So it stands to reason that when in consolation, that's your moment. That's the moment to make a choice. I'll give you a concrete example of that. When I was novice director, a lot of times a novice would go into desolation and they'd want to make a change. They want to leave the novitiate. Uh, and it's, sometimes I was like, yeah, he probably does need to leave. They're like, uh, I might know that, because a lot of novices are called to enter the novitiate but not stay. So I might even think, yeah, he might be called to, to leave, but we don't know that right now because he's in desolation and he's getting bad data. So he goes into desolation, he wants to leave, not because God is calling him to leave, but because he feels so bad right now. So I will try to hold him on. I'll try to tether the balloon. I'll try to keep him there until he gets to a place of consolation. And now, now he's feeling good. Guess what? He doesn't want to think about his vocation. I was like, no, no, no. Now we're going to think about your vocation. Now we're going to do the hard work because now he's in consolation. And here's, this is the moment that he's going to make a good decision when he's in consolation. So consolation is the moment when we can good, make, discern good choices. I think that is, uh, that is all that we need to do today. In the next session, session five, we're going to look at how to prepare for desolation uh, while we're in consolation. And we're going to look at making good decisions. How do we make a good discernment uh, based on Ignatian uh, spirituality, Ignatian, Ignatian rules for discernment. Any questions before we close? Okay, why don't we close with a prayer then? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we thank you, Lord, for, for giving this great gift of the, the Ignatian discernment of spirits. We ask you, Lord, to help us to use this gift to bring us closer to you and to bring others as well ever closer to you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you. We'll see you on session five.